Columbus, Georgia touts many famed people as natives, among them musicians uh, Ma Rainey and Blind Hun Wiggins and comedian Wayne Brady. But one name may not be as famous, Kurt Drady, known for both a Columbus-based film production company and founder of a popular drive-in theater. Drady's first venture in drive-in theaters was the Columbus Drive-In, which opened in an abandoned cow pasture on July 2nd, 1947. And this was the first, the, the um, first drive-in in Columbus and the third drive-in in the Southern region of the United States. This experience combined with his childhood interest in movies, led him to found the Snack View Theater, which opened on October 30th, 1964. The goal of the Snack View, however, was different. It was to provide patrons with free films upon the purchase of their food, rather than the other way around. And their motto was, the show begins when you drive in. The theater was meant to focus on food and short films, which other drive-in theaters at the time were not. Those other theaters were showing three hour long double features. The car capacity for the snack view was expected to be between 100 and 150 cars at a time. But notably this, the first drive-in theater in the country to use transistor radios for improved FM film sound was in Columbus, Georgia. Through the use of archival documents held at Columbus State University, this paper will examine the innovative use of drive-in sound at the Snack View Theater and what that meant for both Columbus and the drive-in movie industry. The first drive-in movie theater opened in Pensacola, New Jersey in 1933, showing family-friendly films with a snack bar at the front of the theater for the patrons' convenience. This concept was motivated by the notion that during times of economic crisis, Americans would be reluctant to give up three things, food, cars, and movies. And the founder of the drive-in theater, Richard Hollingsworth, aimed to merge these three things together. This first drive-in theater was predated by drive-in concept experiments in the 1920s in Comanche, Texas, to broadcast silent films to parked cars. By the middle of the 1960s, there were roughly 4,000 drive-in theaters operating across the United States. When Drady opened the Snack View at 17th Avenue and Manchester Expressway in 1964, the drive-in theater industry and its technology had, made, had undergone changes and improvements to their standards. Drady made some changes to these standards, and one of the main changes were that the ab was that the average program cycle length at the Snack View was 35 to 45 minutes, which Drady and his colleagues considered, considered to be, quote, the proper time for a person to relax and enjoy themselves along with their meal. In fact, one of the things that made Drady's operation so unique was that unlike most drive-ins where each car would buy a ticket and then go to the concession stands to pay extra for food and snacks, patrons at the Snack View would purchase snacks and food and get the cycle of films for free. This was extremely economic, as the advertisement for the opening showed. One could purchase a burger, fries, RC cola with a free apple turnover and a free cycle of films for 29 cents with a regular price of 40 cents. So this is $2.57 and $3.54 respectively in 2021. To put this in perspective, a family of four could have this meal and a cycle of films on a typical night for the equivalent of $14.16 in 2021, less than a single movie ticket would cost today, not factoring in concessions. The cycle of films would repeat upon completion so that those who entered after a cycle began could see the missed films during the next cycle, or they could stay to watch the cycle as many times as they wanted. One of the problems that Drady faced was that he was unable to consistently secure feature films from exhibition from Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, also known as MGM, at the theater due to cost, making it difficult to compete with other drive-ins or even brick-and-mortar theaters. He then attempted to negotiate with MGM for the use of cartoon and newsreels. He was, however, able to secure shorts and cartoons from Warner Brothers for this purpose. For example, one dated program seen here indicates six films totaling one hour, a little longer than his anticipated um, time. 
consisting of, so you want to wear the pants, hotsy footsy, rod hod gala, uh, hot rod galahads, hair splitter, pie in the eye, and Horton hatches an egg. These shows also supported Drady's goal to have a venue for cost-effective, family-friendly entertainment in Columbus, but one that also served the needs of its residents who would no longer have to look for childcare for movie nights or worry about whether their children would disturb other moviegoers. But to show these films, having a state-of-the-art sound system was crucial. Drive-in sound systems did not change all that much in the industry's first 30 years. The first drive-in sound systems used directional sound speakers, similar to public address systems, manufactured by RCA, and mounted on the side of the screens and projected toward the cars. There were several problems with this, one of which concerned the time that light and sound travel, such that the sound would arrive later than the image on the screen. And the further back your car was, it caused the sound to be out of sync with the picture. Uh, this created the, in, in, this um, propelled the move to use in-car sound systems um, over directional sound systems. According to Drady, and this is one of the, the um, speaker polls that we were, I was talking about um, for the in-cars, um, Drady said there were complaints from people who lived near the theater about the soundtrack noise. In those days, we didn't have car speakers. The sound came at you from these two loudspeakers mounted on tall poles. I tested it myself and found that you could hear the soundtrack eight miles away. That forced us to get in-car speakers. To remedy this issue, theaters soon moved to in-car speakers that were tethered to a wire and mounted on a pole. And these were called ramp systems, also manufactured by RCA. Typically, the sound quality of these in-car speakers were also poor, making both dialogue and music almost unintelligible. The music fared the worst. Even by 1966, when improvements were made to drive in theater sound systems, it was still not up to par to even television sound systems, which were relatively weak. However, the main problem was that the speakers were still tethered to speaker poles. We can see this from the diagram from Century Projection Corporation, which was in Drady's papers, um, which illustrates how these systems worked. Um, if you look at the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see, but there were 16 inches of clearance between cars um, in which the speaker would be placed in the middle. The width of the speaker would be about 24 inches, um, mounted on an eight inch high base tethered to a wire parkway cable of an unspecified length. But this too was not ideal. And Drady, like other theater owners, wanted to move away from the in-car wired speakers for one main reason. People were known to drive away with the speaker in their car, uh, thus pulling the pole out of the ground and damaging the sound system and their cars, uh, which necessitated signs like this on the screen or this advertisement. As you leave the theater, folks, please be careful. Don't let this happen to your car. Be sure to remove the speaker before you leave. If you should accidentally pull a speaker loose, please turn it in at our snack bar or box office. Thanks. But the snack view would be different from other theaters. One inter-office memo from Drady stated that there would no longer be speaker poles or in-car speakers. Rather, there would be, quote, radio sound transmission of the film soundtrack directly into the individual's car, individual car's built-in radio with the sound emanating from any of the radio's connected speakers, end quote. The Snackview operation plan touted the new way that the sound would be conveyed, one that did not contain speaker posts. When Drady was planning the theater, he outlined that, quote, all snack view sites consist of a projection room equipped with both 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter carbon and highlight output motion picture sound projection equipment. The snack view operation should not be confused with that of the open air auto, auto, sorry, open air auto drive in movie theater, as, as it is known throughout the country. The snack view is different in many respects. Firstly, you will not find a box office to purchase tickets. Instead, you will be greeted upon first driving into the entrance by a very courteous, bright uniformed young lady attendant who, in greeting you, will hand you a newly developed speaker, small in size, 
radically different from that of the customary drive-in theater. It will have no wires as it will not need them. You will soon discover upon entering the parking area that quality sound will be coming from your original speaker requiring no wires, no connections. In fact, a speaker post so familiar to drive-in theater patrons would, will at first glance be alarmingly absent from sight as they too will not be required in the operation of the snack view." End quote. For this, Drady wanted to use an Ampro projector um, capable of projecting 16 millimeter sound. Um, as his papers show, uh, this was in his papers, uh, but he chose to use 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter sound instead for reasons um, that had to do with the, um, the film uh, gauge that was coming to him from uh, Warner Brothers. But the choice to move from external speakers was not without its problems. In truth, uh, in-car speakers set to an AM station began to be used in drive-in theaters as early as 1946, and it revolutionized the way that people experienced drive-in films. However, the technology was not widely adopted and people were unsure of how they worked. Here is one drive-in clip that show patrons how to do it. This drive-in theater is radioactive. Now you can hear tonight's show on your AM car radio. Turn your ignition key to the accessory position. This will not drain your car battery. Now turn on your radio and zero in on the following AM station. For the first time, people could completely close their car window and hear the film, which was not possible with in-car speakers on the posts. As with many drive-ins at the time, sound was a particular problem. Before this, windows had to be at least partway open for the speaker to connect to the post outside. But this also created a sound echo from the surrounding cars, sometimes at different rates of speed, which was a different problem than when you had the speakers mounted next to the screen. By the 1970s, approximately 97% of car radios were equipped with AM radios only. And a company called Cinema Radio was founded by Frederick Schwartz, in which a low power coaxial cable was used to transmit a leaking AM signal that a car radio could pick up in a drive-in. The plan though, for the snack view, was to use FM radio to broadcast a sound through the radio speakers. The problem was that most cars at the time did not have FM radios. They only began to be installed in radio in cars in 1963. FM transmission was clearer and more reliable than AM transmission because of its signal consistency and therefore provided clearer sound. So it was ideal for this purpose. So by 1964, when the snack view opened, most cars still did not have FM radios, which predated the cinema radio company. In fact, most cars did not have FM radios until the 1980s. To circumvent this issue, Drady gave each car an FM transistor radio, similar to this one, upon entry that would be used to broadcast the film sound, eliminating the need for a built-in FM radio in cars, or exterior speakers wired to poles. This would alleviate the issue of people driving away with the speakers and producing better in-car sound. And you could also adjust the volume as needed as well. To better understand how sound was generated using this transistor system, we need to examine the layout of the snack view. Among Drady's papers are photographs of the theater. In the back of the theater was a two floor building in which the second floor was outfitted with a 35 millimeter projector that routed sound to the uh, system that would then go into the transistor radio. The bottom floor of the building was dedicated to the business office with connections to the restaurants at the front of the theater. You can see this positioning in this photo with the front and the back theater lot and where the cars are parked was actually where the restaurant was and behind it was the speaker. So you can see the positioning of the restaurant and the screen uh, where the cars would be parked in the middle for the film um, and then the building in the back where the film would be transmitted from. The parking area in the front was for those who just wanted to uh, take food out from the restaurant, which was also a possibility. And there were advertisements that you can just get take out and go home and not bother with films. 
this becomes a little clearer when we look at it from above as shown through the theater's blueprints. We can get an even clearer look at it from the, a drawing of the snap view that minimizes the size of the parking area. Um, eventually, Drady's system became well known and other theaters began to circumvent the issue of, of cars, lack of built-in FM radios and use Drady's transistor system until cinema radio system began to be implemented in the 1970s. But by the time most cars had FM radios that could be used for in-car wireless transmission, it was the 1980s and the drive-in theater had reached a zenith. Within the first few months of its operation, the snack view was doing well, and Drady's goal was to expand the venture from a single operation unit in Columbus, which would remain the national headquarters, to each city that had a Royal Crown Cola Nehigh bottler, which we know was found also in Columbus, um, including Gainesville, Florida, Natchez, Mississippi, Nashville, Tennessee, and Charleston, South Carolina. At the time, there were bottlers in nine states that he could have conceivably uh, distributed his theaters to, which were Arkansas, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And this was because of Drady's association with the Columbus-born soft drink company, which was being served exclusively in the snack view. Drady would have likely been able to expand his operations, including touting this new sound system with the appropriate cooperation, especially from film distributors, and this is key but his dream never got that far. When the snack view seized operations in July, 1965, they blamed it on a lack of cooperation from six film distribu distribution companies, but naming only Disney by name, curiously, for not providing enough films to continue operation. And by a certain point, they wound up recycling their programs um, to the point where people just stopped coming. Because of this lack of programming, the Snap Views Theater closed after 13 months of operation. And it was nine months after um, it had started that these programs would be repeated, only to leave the restaurant part of it opening, uh, operating. Drady soon sold the theater to owners from Macon, who renamed it the Skyview Drive in Theater, which reopened under new management and new name on December 2nd, 1966, as reported in the Columbus Inquirer. And Drady made it very clear that it would have no association with the Snack View restaurant and would operate its own concession stand. So even though the Snack View restaurant would still be on the same property as the Sky View, it would have no affiliation um, and it would not be their um, concessions. However, an intent to dissolve the Snack View Corporation was not legally filed until April 28th, 1972. This is what the space looks like today with the projection building still standing. And again, if you want to drive by, it's on 17th Avenue and Manchester Expressway. Despite Drady's efforts at creating a family-friendly entertainment venue where the show begins where you drive in, he was unable to keep the venture going for as long as he'd liked, even with his new type of sound system. He would eventually move to start a film production company, Cinema View, which would produce Columbus's famed movie, Kiss of the Tarantula, though that venture too would fail. And even until today, Drady remains on the Writers Guild of America's unfair list 24 years after his death for unfair labor practices related to the Cinema View. But it's for the Snack View and its innovations that Drady should be remembered. Ultimately, a small drive-in theater in little Columbus, Georgia, whose owner had big dreams, helped to revolutionize the technology of, and sound of drive-in theaters in the 1960s. Thank you.